Yeah. Well, man, I'm excited about this new uh, series that we're in. How many people enjoyed the decorations when they came in? I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. And then some of you probably didn't even recognize it, which that's okay, cool. We just stood up here all night long. Thanks for appreciating us. Yeah. No, I'm just giving you a hard time, man. We have a great creative team, man, and they try to create a cool environment just to be cool and creative. Um, this sermon series is a very important sermon series. It's going to be a sermon series that may be fun in moments, but it's also going to be a sermon series that may eat your lunch. Um, everybody in here has people, a relationship, where they try to suck the life out of you in some way, shape, or form. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about controlling people. Next week, we're going to be talking about critical people. Then the week three, we're going to be talking about needy people. In week four, we're going to be talking about hypocritical people and how they can, like vampires, they can suck the life out of us in our relationships. Um, this one we're going to talk about today uh, is, how do I say this? It's speaking to me. Um, I have been a person who's been controlled, and I've also been a person who's been controlling. Uh, and a lot of you can relate to that as well. Um, so I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, how do I preach this? How do you, how do you biblically preach this? There's got to be somewhere in the Bible, and the first thing that pops up is what? Well, Jezebel. Jezebel was a controller. I was like, everybody's heard that message. Lord, I want to do something different. So I'll be honest with you. I have to give props to Google today of all people. Um, I Googled it, and I said, controlling people in the Bible. And a verse popped up, and I was like, well, that can't be right. That ain't got nothing to do with control. But the more I read it, the more I understood that's exactly what it was dealing with. And Jesus shows us how to love someone who's trying to control you. So I want to talk to you about that today. Before I do that, I want to pray because I want you to know something that this church is not my ministry for me to build. It belongs to the Lord. They that labor in vain, unless the Lord build the house, they'll labor in vain. So I want you to know that everything we do is to glorify God, even me speaking today. I want you to see Jesus. I don't want you to see me. So I ask the Lord right now that he invade this atmosphere. That he anoint my lips and my tongue. That every stronghold that the enemy has thrown at people to cause them to be trapped. Lord, I thank you that your word brings life and freedom to that situation right now, God. Lord, I ask that you help me communicate this message with clarity today. Lord, I ask that you increase and I decrease. All of you and none of me. And everybody said, amen. I want to ask the question today. How many people live with somebody that's controlling or you know somebody that's controlling? How many people? Yeah. Right? Well, if you're that person pulling that person's arm down right now, you may be a controller. And I saw a few of that happening. Yeah, and then I just saw the little hand bump right there too. Yeah, you're going to get it when you get home. Shut it up. Yeah. 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 Ding, ding, ding. Great day to come today. <laughs> Here's what I want to tell you. I want to lay some groundwork real quick about controlling people. Um, as a pastor, a leader, I have had to deal with this a lot. And I'm still dealing with it. Um, I've got a lot of failed attempts at it. But I honestly believe I'm starting to win in this area now because God has showed me. So here's what I've learned about controlling people. Number one is, is that most of the time controlling people are not malicious people they're malicious but not maliciously trying to control you they just may be somebody who's battling insecurity most of the time they've been hurt really bad and they're in a place where they say I don't want to experience that pain anymore so I'm going to control my situations because I'm in charge of it and I don't give you the right to do that. So I'll just be controlling. That's usually what happens most of the time. 
Most of the time, I have saw that. Now, I want you to know some. I'm going to give you a lot of information today. Um, it's just stuff I've learned. It's also some books that I have read. And if you want to know what those books are at the end of service, come up to me. And if I've got, I'll let you use it or I'll give it to you. So here's what I learned about controlling people. Two things that controlling people have and they use as weapons. The first weapon that they use are threats. Threats. What do you mean, Pastor? I wrote some things down. And this is what I've heard before. Maybe you've heard it. You better do this or. If you don't do this, you're going to pay for it. How many has ever heard that? Right? The second weapon, and I hear this weapon used against me a lot more than threats, and that is guilt. They use guilt. I can't believe that after all I've done for you. You mean to tell me you won't do this for me? I thought we were friends. Maybe you're in a relationship and you're trying to abstain until you get married and I thought you loved me. If you love me, then you'll do this with me. Controlling. And unfortunately, we battle this with our relatives. Have you ever called your grandmom or your mom and they say this right here? You never call me anymore. For goodness sakes, I could have been dead for two weeks and you not known about it. Happened to me. Yep. Shame, guilt. They try to do that through manipulation and control. Here's what I want to share with you today. I want to share with you the passage of Scripture where Jesus was, was, they were trying to control him. Now, this wasn't some random person that was trying to control Jesus. This was someone very close to Jesus in Jesus' inner circle. Most of the time, they ate with him. I mean, they spent most of their day, day and night, when they did the ministry with him. They traveled with him. And this person tries to control Jesus. Let's read it. It's Matthew chapter 16, verse 22 through 24. It says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind, the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Go back to verse 22. I want to point something out to you that's very important. G excuse me, it says, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, let me set this context up for you real quick because this blew my mind when I read this. In verse 18, which is just a few verses before 22, Jesus is with the disciples. And it says they're on the coast of Caesarea and Philippi. And he asked the disciples, who do men, who are these people saying that I am? And the disciples begin to say, well, man, some say you one of the prophets that has come back to life from the old, man. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say, man, you're, you're a great teacher. And Jesus looks at them and says, but who do you say that I am? And guess what? Peter says, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And he says, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you but only my Father in heaven. And he says, from this point forward, you are going to be called Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on this earth, it'll be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on this earth, it'll be loosed in heaven. What an incredible thing for the Messiah to say to somebody, right? This is what just happened. 
And then in four verses later, Jesus tells the same guy to get behind me, Satan. So let's look at it. Now we know what's happened. Jesus gets through with that and he says, hey guys, I'm going to die. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, the elders of the church. I'm going to be turned over to them. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to give my life as a ransom for many. And you know what the response to that was? Verse 22, Peter took Jesus aside. What kind of person pulls the Messiah to the side and begins to rebuke him? Who in the room would do that? If Jesus come in here right now and said, I'm coming in here to die for you all over again, who's going to pull him aside and say, no, nah, bro, that ain't happening? That's what Peter did. And I learned something in this moment, that controlling people, they try to isolate you. They'll try to pull you away and get you away from godly voices or influences in your life, and they pull you away and they try to control you and say, never. That is never going to happen. They'll have to get through me first. That's what happens. Now, I want to teach you today how Jesus, through these few scriptures, how he dealt with someone who tried to control him. First thing is number one, and that is, and I think it's very important, is that know what you are called to do. You see, Jesus knew what his calling was. He knew that he was called to come in human form and to give his life as a ransom for many so that me and you could be free when we stand before God and that we could have access to the Father. He knew that. And that's why when Peter tried to tell him, no, that ain't happening, Jesus is like, mm-mm. I know what God's called me to do. Now, this may be a touchy subject for some people. But what if I don't know what my calling is, Pastor? What, what, what if I don't know, like, what, I, what I'm supposed to be doing? You know, I've had a lot of people ask me that question. And I really believe God has brought clarity to me in that. Here's what I want to tell you about your calling. Sometimes your calling is not something that is so extravagant that the whole world goes, wow, that brother's in his calling. Wow, I've called to be the next president or wow, I've called to be the next great worship pastor or, or the next CEO of a Fortune 500 company or whatever. I want to submit something to you today. Maybe God's called you to be a wife. Maybe God's called you to be a mother. Or maybe God's just put you in a season where you need to grow. Maybe God's called you, and this is a big one, and it gets me every time. God's called you to be a witness on your job. You know, man, we come to this place, man, and we got everybody in the room that's all like-minded. We all believe in Jesus. We all love Jesus, and we all have great you know, attitudes or whatever, but when we get on the job... That's a whole different atmosphere. Now, I'm going to begin to let the atmosphere control me, and I'll respond that way. That's not what Christ asked us to do. He asked us to be lights in dark places. You know, I don't know if you remember this, but I had the opportunity. I've been raised in church my whole life, so I've about seen it all. But I can remember being in church and being a small kid and if it had not been for children's ministry, I swear to you, man, I don't really feel like I would know the stuff that I know. I learned more in children's ministry than I have any time in my life. That's why it's so important to us. But we used to sing a song, and it started off like this right here. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And then it says what? Hide it under a bush. Oh, no. I'm going to let hey, shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I guess that was only for children's ministry. It breaks my heart. Because we have experienced freedom from him. 
I've seen it. I've seen several of you walk up here and experience freedom. And then you walk out in the world and you just act like it was just a cheap price paid for you. When in fact it cost him everything. Heaven was bankrupt for that. That may be your calling to be a witness on a job that you hate where you don't get along with anybody. What I love about Pastor Carolyn, she's not even here right now. She's having to work. And she, the place she works is for law enforcement. And man, it's a hostile environment. And I always worry about her. And I ask her, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? And man, you know, honestly, sometimes she goes, well, it's a little stressful. But you know what she says most of the time? Man, God's given me a great opportunity to share Jesus with people. What kind of person says that? You know what kind of person says that? A person who knows what God called them to do. This message is going to be real personal today because I'm going to share some intimate things with you about me. You know, I, I believe that God has called me to be a servant to Him. I also believe God's called me to be a husband to my wife. He's called me to be a father to my two little girls. He's called me to be a son to my mother and father. He's called me to be a big brother to my brothers. And he's also called me to be an apostle for him. But you know what happens to me most of the time? I do something that a lot of you do. And that is I fall into a people-pleasing mentality. I begin to people-please and I allow people to control me. As a pastor, man, you would not believe that people think that I should be everywhere and do everything at the same time. I should be in every situation that you're going through. I should be in every moment of your life. And I'll be honest with you, I want to be. But you know what happens when I do that? Then I don't become a servant. I don't become a husband. I don't become a father. And I'm being controlled through people pleasing. Until one day, God, man, he showed me something. It broke me. He said, Jason, you are an idolater. You idolize what people think about you more than me. And you worship that. So I want you to know today that if you're being controlled and you value what people say more than what God has called you to do, then you're serving that. And that's your God. Number two, know when someone is trying to control you. See, Jesus knew when Peter was controlling him. You know why? Because he knew what God called him to do. If I know that God has called me to be a husband to my wife, and that's most important to me, and then I got somebody over here trying to pull me away from being what God has called me to do, then I know, hey, wait a minute, this person's trying to control me here. And they're taking me off of what God has called me to do. And I've got to stop that. Here's what I want you to know about Peter. Peter wasn't a bad person. How many people believe that Peter loved Jesus? Right? I believe he loved him. You know what Peter's problem was in this moment? Peter's problem in this moment was he was trying to put his will ahead of God's will. He was more consumed with how that was going to affect him than what God's will was. And because of that, he didn't even know what God's plan was. He didn't even know that God was trying to do something that was going to give him eternity with him. Had no idea. And I think that what happens a lot of times with people who try to control us. Their will is what they want. And they try to control it because this is what I want. 
Number three, know when to draw the line in the sand. Jesus does a very good job at this. When he realized that he was being in control, he draws a line in the sand. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Let's pull it up. That's what he says. Then Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the minds, the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Get behind me, Satan. He drew the line in the sand. Now, let me make sure I have exact clarity here because some people take what I say literal. The next time your grandmama calls you on the phone and she starts that guilt trip, do not say, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Probably won't go well for you. Probably won't. If she's out of state, she'll be in state real soon. Yeah. If you were my grandmama, she would. So, bless her, Lord. But think about that. I want you to think if Jesus did not draw the line in the sand. What if Jesus was codependent? What if Jesus depended on God, but also depended on what people said about him? What would that transaction look like? Let's just go there for a minute. Peter comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, that ain't going to happen on my watch. I love you. I got you. They're not going to come and do that. Thank you, Peter. That means a lot to me that you love me that much that you'll defend me. You know what? You're right. Ain't nobody going to get to me. As a matter of fact, I don't even think I'm going to go to the cross and die for these people because I want to make sure that you do what you want to do. And heck, people don't need the Holy Spirit to come. They'll be okay. And we probably would not be sitting here right now. You know, also, if Jesus was codependent, you know what that meant? That meant that God wouldn't be leading him. Peter was. I want you to know if you are allowing someone to control you, then they're leading you. Let me tell you something. You know what every controller has in common? Every one of them. Every person that has a controlling spirit on them, you know what they all have in common? Somebody that allows it. Period. I want you to know something. Controlling is allowed. You are allowing it. Like me, I was allowing it. I fell into a people-pleasing. I wanted to make people happy. I allowed it. You know, I was thinking as I put this message together, how many people in this room, in their life, you're allowing someone in their dysfunction to distract you from your God-given calling and purpose? Because you idolize what they say and you lessen what God says. How many people rides by a cemetery? We see them. They're all over town, right? You know, they say the cemetery is the most wealthiest place on earth. They say it's also the smartest place on earth, too. Because there's a bunch of books that never got wrote. There's a lot of people who never pursued their dream. There's a lot of preachers in there that never come to preach. There's a lot of husbands in there that never was a husband. Very wealthy place. You know why? People controlled them, distracted them. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to knock you off of what God called you to do. We can't allow that. We got to draw a line in the sand. So, what do we do? If someone is controlling us, what do I do? I want to read you two statements that are very powerful that help me deal with this situation. The first statement is this. The relationships you have are a combination of what you created and allowed. Every relationship that you have, it is a combination of what you have created and what you have allowed. So, 
you created and allowed someone to control you. You have that power to draw the line in the sand. Number one, you must recognize what God's called you to do. Number two, you need to identify they're trying to control me. And number three, you got to draw a line in the sand. The second statement is this. If you don't like what you have, change what you accept, excuse me, expect and what you accept. Great point right here. How many parents we got in here? We're going to Walmart. All right. I already see the head shaking. We put the kids in the buggy. What they start doing? I want this. I want this. I want this. Now, if you're like me, I got the talking before we got in the house, in the, in the grocery store. Don't you look at nothing. Don't you ask for nothing. And keep your hands in your pockets. I'm going to beat your legs off of you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. But I take my little girl into Walmart. She said, Daddy, I want this. Daddy, I want this. Daddy, I want this. Now, here's what's happening. If I give her everything she wants, every time she comes in there, what's she going to do? She's going she's to expect it, right? Now, I have a choice whether I want to accept that or not. And I'll be completely honest with you on this stage. I'm pretty strong until about 20 minutes of just screaming bloody murder. Then I'm done. Fine, you can have it. Don't be like, some of y'all do the same thing. Don't be lying. But what are you going to expect and what are you going to accept? Let the people know moving forward, I'm not going to accept this anymore. And here's what I'm expecting. I'm expecting whatever it is. Now, the last thing, and this is a hard one. What if I am the king of the control? What if I am the controller? This is a tough one because a lot of you don't want to admit that you're a controller. But you are. For me, I fall into this category sometimes. And I'm being vulnerable with you. My wife, will, she's done walked out, thank God, but she'd be back there shaking her head. Yeah. Here's why. I like to play God sometimes. I like to call the shots. I like to be in control. I want it to go this way, this way, this way, and this way. But here's what I realized. That when I do that, I'm doing the same thing that Satan did. I'm trying to elevate myself and my will above God's will. And I'm trying to play God. You know what I always find out? That I don't make a good God at all. A pretty bad one. And I bet you do too. Mamas, do you have the power to control your child's future? No, you don't. But God does. How many in here know someone who's battling an addiction? Do you have the power to take that addiction from them? But God does. How many people in here have loved ones that are lost and need Jesus? Do you have the power to save them? But God does. When we realize that we don't have that power, we'll stop controlling people. You know, this has been a very difficult thing because I don't intentionally try to control people. I just want to get the job done. But you know what I do? I say, God, I can save that person. God, I can meet with that person with an addiction and, man, I can win them to you. But I want you to know something. Unless the Holy Spirit draws them, ain't nothing I can do. I can, I can pray. 
but it's God's power that changes. So today, I want to close with the last verse. And that is what Jesus said, not to Peter. He addressed everybody. Here's what he says. Can we pull that verse up, verse 24? Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to be in a relationship with me, this is what he's saying. They must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Here's what I want you to know. And I put this as my big idea today. And that is this. No matter how much threats or guilt you try to throw at someone, you don't have the power to change them. But God does. Surrender. Give it to Him. You know, this morning, we uh, do a pre-service huddle. All our leaders get together and we talk about vision and we talk about, you know, things that are going to happen during the service and we pray for this service. And we remind people why they do what they do. And as I was praying before, man, the Lord spoke to me and said, my people need a fresh anointing. And I share that with our leaders. And I feel like God wants me to share it with you too. What I mean by fresh anointing is, is that we have to constantly, often allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. I want you to know, man, the anointing that I had last week to lead, I need a fresh anointing to lead this week. There are new people, there are new levels, and there's new attacks. And I need God to help me. Two things can happen. I can try to do it on my own and play God, and I will fail miserably. Or I can say, Lord, you increase and let me decrease. You lead me. Give me a fresh anointing. I believe that's people in here today. You need a fresh anointing today. Don't leave this place without asking Him for it. I believe it's simple. It's as simple as, Lord, give me a fresh anointing. Fill me up. I want to be a light out in this dark world. I want to be a great husband, a great wife, a great mother, a great father. I don't want to be controlled, and I don't want to be a controller. I want you to lead, and I want to follow your ways. I encourage you to do that today. Can we all stand? Every service, we offer someone the opportunity to know Jesus. And I want you to know something about this. That becoming saved and following Him is not just a prayer that you say. It is a life change. Literally, repentance in this context means to turn away from your old life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says something so powerful. It says, therefore, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old life is gone, and now all things are new. If you want a new life today, and you want to leave that past behind, I can't do it, but God can. The Bible declares in Romans chapter 10, it says that if you believe and you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So I want to encourage you to do that today. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I want you to get somewhere today, whether it's alone in your car or at your house alone. And I want you to have that conversation with him. You can do it right here if you want to. But I want you to say, Lord, search my heart. I want you to be Lord of my life. 
I want to turn away from my old life. And I want to follow you. I believe that you died on a cross and three days later you rose from the grave. And I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. Have that conversation with him today.